I, mean, I think this 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 point about <laughs> is somebody conscious can can come up in ways that you know just are unimaginable until you're actually faced with certain patients at the bedside, and um, you know I. <laughs> I mean, they, this comes up in almost all of our work, but there are some cases that you know I, I still go home every night and I think about and and I worry a lot about because you know we know that some people can be locked in. Anybody who's seen the diving bell and the butterfly has encountered an example of this. Somebody's fully conscious, they've lost their motor function, and they come out. So from but, all from the outside perspective, they seem totally without consciousness. No, if you're a good examiner, you can figure out they're conscious right away. It's no problem. This isn't the problem. Okay. I'm setting it up. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> How do you know? Just to, what? Yeah. How do you know? Right because away. you have a reliable communication channel. Okay, so this is like a sort of a, a bar, right? And so, so there's. An, I mean, it's probably worth kind of saying operationally when we're yeah. looking at patients. So there's coma and vegetative state, and at least by definition, when a neurologist looks at a patient and identifies them as in coma or vegetative, it means the same thing from a behavioral point of view in that. There's no evidence that they're responding to the world. There's no evidence that they're taking in sensory information and are aware of it. And the difference between coma and vegetative state is a technical one. It has to do with the uh, arousal systems in the brainstem returning a patterning of an eyes open, eyes closed change in the eye opening and eye closure. This is not related to sleep and wake. It's not associated with the kind of electrical activity you see in sleep. And it's just a part of the sort of the typical recovery pattern after coma with, you know, some fine print for the neurologist in the audience that there are occasionally eyes open comas and they're associated with particular kind of injury. But at the very border of vegetative state, the next level of recovery, which is now being called minimally conscious state, you start to see sort of unambiguous signs of some response to the environment. And in the sort of gray zone between these two conditions are things that are just tracking of a visual image or uh, an alt uh, their eyes look over to a sound, and th although those don't seem very different than just opening your eyes and closing them, it turns out that they're increasingly recognized that even those small signs can make huge differences in prognosis in patients. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that's not being dealt with very well because there's nowhere to put people like this early on, and they can go on for weeks to recover. And you know, they might some of them might recover so that they're ambulating and walking around in a year and not get adequate therapy. So, you know, this is sort of like a major issue. But as you move on and people start to recover more function, they might start to respond to a command. And then that becomes very obvious that somebody is, you know, lift up, give me a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, that's mo most people can get that that's like okay, that it, maybe that's all they can do. Their level of consciousness fits into this minimally conscious state, but, you know, that's what the neurologists want to call it. For a lot of people, they're just conscious and that's that's it. But operationally, once we can communicate with somebody with a yes or a no that's reliable, you know, lift, you lift your thumb up on the right for yes, lift your thumb up on the left for no, and do this every time we come to the bedside, then that, that's transferring out. But there are these locked-in patients who, as in the diving bell yes. and the butterfly, who only have control over their uh, eye blinking. Right, eye blinking so or eye movement or head what, movement. The question that always obsesses me about uh, these patients is, how do we know there aren't locked in patients who are just like that, except they don't have control <laughs> right. of so, the eye so, so you anticipate why I was setting all this up for the audience. Right. So that's exactly right. Yeah. So two, two examples. One example is a published case, if anybody wants to read about it. It was a patient who was locked in classically with a brainstem injury, who my colleagues and I saw, who had an unusual extension of the injury into the auditory system. The auditory system is usually very well preserved because it's bilateral. It goes to both sides of the brain. But this person ended up with a central auditory agnosia. And what that means is they could hear, but they couldn't really put together complex sounds. Mm -hmm. And as a result, although it was unrecognized for many months, they relied primarily on lip reading. But anytime somebody would come and try to test their cognitive level, they would get to a point where this person just seemed like they fell off the curve. And they were judged to be minimally conscious or cognitively impaired. And it wasn't until my colleague, Joe Giacino, finally figured out to draw and write the questions, that it became clear that the person was fully conscious, okay, mm -hmm. and just needed to have the visual representation of the words. Okay, so but in that case, they're locked in, they're fine. But the kind of cases that we're dealing with now that I think are really most troubling are patients who, at times, are just like a locked-in patient. Look down for yes, look to the side for no, 
accurate communication for two hours a day. They can try to work with a BCI, but they're not good enough to get one, or they're not good enough to use one reliably. And, under, and, this, and then this challenges, the, it gives an urgency to the whole problem, because now you have an urgency to treat, because you want this person to come out, and you need to understand what are the problems they're having. Is it that they're not able to control their motor function, or is their conscious state having a problem? And how do we make those measurements? And that's, that's kind of like, you know, that's one example. There are many.